Hello and welcome to Playback, Tier 2 World's weekly showcase of our best stories from around the globe. Coming up, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan welcomes a statement by the U.S. Embassy and its allies about not interfering in a host country's internal affairs. The U.S. appeals to extradite WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, who is wanted by Washington on 18 criminal charges for publishing classified military documents. The UN calls on governments to take urgent action as greenhouse gas concentrations hit a new record high. The war in Syria has internally displaced 6.8 million people. Some families have found refuge from the conflict by building an underground city in the country's north. Turkey has welcomed a statement by the United States and nine other Western nations reaffirming their commitment to the Vienna Convention. It ended a week-long crisis that threatened to deeply damage diplomatic ties. Our correspondent Yunus Paksoy reports from Washington, D.C. A diplomatic crisis averted after the United States and nine other Western countries, including France and Germany, backed down from their joint statement a week ago demanding the release of a Turkish prisoner. The U.S. Embassy in Ankara tweeted that it maintains compliance with Article 41 of the Vienna Convention. Other countries followed suit as Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan cautiously welcomed the move. I believe these ambassadors who stated their commitments to Article 41 of the Vienna Convention ought to not interfere in the internal affairs of a country will be more careful in their statements regarding Turkey's sovereign rights. I would also like to state that anybody who does not respect our country's sensitivities and its independence, no matter what their position is, cannot stay in this country. Ankara says the U.S.-led joint statement disrespected Turkey's sovereignty. First of all, this is an insult at our judges, prosecutors and lawyers. According to Article 138 of our Constitution, Turkey's judiciary cannot be interfered in. We cannot tolerate ambassadors questioning Turkey's judiciary, while even the country's legislative and executive organs cannot interfere according to the Turkish Constitution. The U.S. State Department said the best path forward is cooperation. Uh, we've taken note of President Erdogan's most recent remarks. Uh, we will continue to promote the rule of law uh, and respect for human rights globally. Uh, the Biden administration seeks cooperation with Turkey on common priorities. While the State Department say they believe they didn't break any conventions, relations are going through a rough patch ahead of a potential bilateral meeting between Turkish and U.S. presidents this weekend. Yunus Paksoy, Tiyatı World, Washington. The Turkish parliament has approved a motion to extend the state's authority to launch cross-border military operations in northern Iraq and Syria for another two years. The measure allows Turkey to deploy troops and expand its missions along the country's southern border. It also stresses the danger posed by the PKK and YPG terrorist organizations. The motion says all actions are in line with the country's national security interests. The Turkish president has become the first foreign leader to visit Fuzuli International Airport in Azerbaijan. It's the first major infrastructure project to be completed in Karabakh. The region used to be controlled by Armenian forces before being liberated by Azerbaijan last year. Our diplomatic correspondent Andrew Hopkins reports from Zangilan. Touchdown in the former occupied territories, the show of support by the Turkish president for his Azerbaijani counterpart. Construction of Fazuli International Airport only started in January. Now it's open for business. Its first international guest, President Erdogan. The roads and railways that will pass through this area are going to create economic opportunities not only for Turkey and Azerbaijan, but for all countries in the region. One day you'll be able to go directly from Zangazur to Istanbul. This region's potential as a transport and logistics hub will be realized. Azerbaijan's neighbors, Iran, Georgia and Armenia will benefit from this development and no one is excluded. President Aliyev showed his Turkish counterpart around, not only the airport, but other construction projects in the region. A groundbreaking ceremony for a new highway and a new farming project 
Azerbaijan's government has allocated more than a billion dollars this year for reconstruction. Today, our participation in the opening of Fuzuli International Airport symbolizes our unity and strength. This shows that Turkey and Azerbaijan, like two brother countries, are always on each other's side. Here in Zengilen, they're building a smart village, a settlement that will be self-sufficient and supplied by sustainable energy, including solar power. Behind the new village, a snapshot of what much of this region is still like, derelict buildings and huge swathes of land that have fallen into decay or turned into minefields which have still to be cleared. Land like this which used to be under the control of Armenian forces for several decades has experienced little development. It was left largely empty and served as a buffer zone. Now the Azerbaijani government wants to totally redevelop it and let the people who once lived here return home. The government hopes that smart villages like this will help to bring people back. Hundreds of thousands of Azerbaijanis fled this area during the war in the 1990s. But redeveloping it will take many years and a lot of money, and many will have to wait to return. Andrew Hopkins, TRT World, Zangilan, Azerbaijan. The U.S. has launched a fresh attempt to have WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange extradited from Britain. The U.S. is appealing a decision by a London judge in January that said Assange couldn't be sent abroad due to his mental health. Washington claims the court was misled by Assange's psychiatrist. The 50-year-old is wanted in the U.S. on 18 criminal charges for publishing hundreds of thousands of documents related to the U.S.'s wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Mehmet Solmas reports. Ahead of the appeal hearing, Julian Assange supporters continue their demonstrations in central London. Earlier this year, the judge blocked the United States extradition request because of concerns over his mental health and risk of suicide in the U.S. Assange faces 18 charges, all relating to his publication of half a million classified documents detailing U.S. military campaigns in Afghanistan and Iraq. If he gets extradited, I mean, he's a symbol. And if they extradite him, that is the stamp on the legal system saying, yes, we can extradite anyone who speaks the truth that we don't like anywhere around the world. During the hearing, Assange's lawyers are expected to present a report by Yahoo News, which claimed that the CIA was plotting to kidnap or assassinate Assange while he was staying at Ecuador's London embassy for seven years. Assange's lawyer and partner, Stella Morris, likened the threat of extradition to the murder of Washington Post journalist and Saudi dissident Jamal Khashoggi. It is now known that the CIA was plotting to murder Julian uh, and kidnap him and carry out completely illegal acts, uh, just like the Saudi government uh, did to uh, Jamal Khashoggi and actually carried out the murder they were, the CIA was planning to do against Julian. And so what's at stake? Well, the UK courts uh, have to decide uh, whether they can possibly uh, extradite a person to the country that has plotted to murder him. So far, the US government has not commented on the allegations. So the scenario is this. Julian, if extradited, will, his fate will be in the hand of the agency who was drawing her plans to kill or kidnap him. That's unthinkable. The hearing is set down for two days, but a decision is not expected for four to six weeks. If the extradition is granted, Assange faces 175 years in a U.S. prison. Mehmet Solmaz, TRT World. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres warns time is running out to tackle the climate crisis. He made the comments as thousands of delegates prepare to tackle the climate question at the COP26 summit in Glasgow, Scotland. G20 leaders in particular need to deliver. The time has passed for diplomatic niceties. If governments, especially G20 governments, do not stand up and lead this effort, we are headed for terrible human suffering. But all countries need to realize that the old carbon-burning model of development is a death sentence for their economies and for our planet. 
The UN Environment Programme says current commitments to cut carbon emissions fall short of what's needed to adequately reduce global temperature rises. And even if countries stick to those pledges, it may be too little, too late. Polo Montesilo reports. Far from the turmoil in the capital, Kabul, farmers in this remote Afghan province are facing a different tragedy. Their livelihoods have dried up as a result of a severe drought. We had two years of drought. Our flocks of sheep have shrunk from 20,000 to around 3,000. We haven't been able to cultivate crops for two years because of the drought. The UN says with crop yields dwindling and herds dying off, as many as 22 million Afghans may go hungry this year. The devastation highlights the need to slash greenhouse emissions and curb global heating as quickly as possible. But the UN Environment Programme says nations haven't stepped up. In a new report, the agency points out that existing government commitments would only slash predicted 2030 emissions by 7.5 percent. That's a far cry from the 55 percent reduction needed to keep global temperatures from rising 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. As it stands, the world's on track to recording temperatures up to 2.7 degrees Celsius higher. Another UN agency says the amount of harmful gases in the atmosphere is also increasing. Today we are talking about, uh, about greenhouse gases and, uh, and, and, and uh, we have again broken records in, in main greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide, uh, methane and, and nitrous uh, oxide. And, uh, and, and this negative trend that we have been observing already for, for decades has continued also. The reports come ahead of the COP26 climate conference in Scotland this weekend. The UN wants to pressure small and large polluters to reduce their fossil fuel consumption so vulnerable communities aren't hung out to dry. Paolo Montesilio, TRT World. Southeast Asian leaders have held their annual summit without a representative from Myanmar. The bloc excluded the junta leader for failing to agree to a regional peace deal. In response, Myanmar's military refused to send a junior representative to the summit. Myanmar has been in turmoil since the February coup that ousted civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi. More than a thousand civilians have been killed by security forces in mass protests against the military. This is a very uh, big step for the ASEAN countries. Usually this organization is not known for taking any bold actions against member states because it sees non-interference as one of its core principles. And this is now the first time in ASEAN's history that uh, one country, uh, the leader of one country is not allowed to join the summit. Um, the uh, ASEAN members, they have invited, uh, as you said, a non-political representative uh, from Myanmar, but Myanmar's junta has not agreed to that. So their screen at uh, today's virtual summit remained empty. And with this yeah, unprecedented decision, ASEAN leaders are showing now that they have lost patience with Myanmar's military. The junta in Myanmar had already approved a peace plan that was negotiated with ASEAN countries in April. But uh, since then, no progress has been seen. The violence in the country continues. And there is also still no meaningful dialogue with the opposition. And yeah, Myanmar's neighbors, they are now hoping that uh, with increasing pressure, they will finally be able to bring change to Myanmar. The war in Syria has forced 6.3 million refugees to flee the country. It's also left another 6.8 million Syrians internally displaced. In the country's north, some people have survived the conflict by building their own underground city. Obaida Hito sent us this report from Al Bab. 160 men, women and children live in this sprawling temporary shelter. Only this one is underground. Um Hamid was displaced with her four children from Deir Zor four years ago. Her husband was killed and she can't return home. We left Abdul Kamal because of the bombing. We went from village to village until we reached here in Al Bab. I have orphans and one of my children has special needs. I don't have anything to support them with. 
One child sells cookies in the market to bring us money. Khaled Abdullah has lived here since he fled Deir Zor with his family four years ago. He oversees the operations of this underground community. When we first came here, this was a storage facility that was completely empty. Over the years, we built these small rooms to house people displaced by the fighting and bombardments. This place can house around 50 families. Thousands of people have come and gone, especially during large waves of displacement. But recently, there are fewer people fleeing and around 30 families live here. The small area has 10 narrow alleyways, 42 rooms, electricity 24 hours a day, free internet, a classroom, and clean water. More children than adults live here now, including Um Abdurrahman's seven children. We are living here like one family. If someone is sick, we visit them. If someone is poor, we help them. We help one another always. We even cook together and have social gatherings. We have become like a family after spending nearly five years like this. Some residents volunteer to teach the children how to read and write. Many of them have not been able to attend school their entire lives. Some of the children were afraid to come to class. Some of them tried to attend school before, but they were kicked out. I found some of the older children didn't know how to read or write, but were full of potential. So now I'm teaching them how to read and write Arabic properly, as if they didn't learn anything before. According to the UN, around one million displaced people in Syria live in empty buildings and the ruins of bombed out towns and villages instead of aid camps. The people living under this building call their small community the city that doesn't see the sun. Above ground, people pass by unaware that there's life beneath their feet. Even though they feel safe, sheltered away from the outside world, they hope that they'll see the sunshine over their homes one day soon. Obeidahito, TRT World, Al Bab, Syria. It's official. We're now less than 100 days away from the Beijing Winter Olympics. But hosts China are facing the dual threats of the COVID-19 pandemic and increasing calls for the International Olympic Committee to postpone the Games unless China ends its persecution of Uyghur Muslims. Lance Santos reports. Beijing. Chinese President Xi Jinping has called for a simple, safe and splendid Winter Olympics. But with mounting COVID-19 infections and international criticism of the country's human rights record, the Games are anything but straightforward. The opening ceremony takes place at the National Bird's Nest Stadium on February the 4th, kicking off two weeks of world-class competition. Accepting the Olympic flame from Greece last week, organizers promised a safe and successful tournament. The Olympic flame will travel to the Great Wall and across other parts of China, bringing with the light of peace and friendship. As I speak, the COVID-19 pandemic is still raging. Under the principle of always placing the lives and health of people front and center, we will have a different but innovative flame display. Beijing is adopting a similar approach to Tokyo's earlier this year. As it stands, local fans are permitted, but foreign spectators will be banned from attending. Olympic staff and media personnel will be subject to strict COVID-19 rules and will stay in a closed-loop system. And anyone entering the country who hasn't been vaccinated will have to quarantine for three weeks. But COVID-19 isn't the biggest threat to the success of Beijing 2022. There are growing calls from human rights groups to boycott the Olympics. China has been widely condemned for its treatment of ethnic minorities. Currently, as we stand here, millions of Uyghurs are suffering in concentration camps in the 21st century, where they're subjected to torture, sexual abuse, including rape. IOC President Thomas Bach has dodged questions about Beijing's human rights record and the persecution of Uyghur Muslims. And organizers are plowing ahead with preparations. The first day of skeleton and bobsleigh testing at the National Sliding Center has gone down well with several athletes. 
Yeah, the track and uh, the buildings around the track are all so beautiful and so good. The warm-up area is fantastic. Yeah, I think uh, we've been really blown away by the scale, the size, the everything. It's, it's, the, it's the biggest thing we've seen in, uh, in bobsleigh. It's crazy. There's no doubt China is well prepared, but will its bio bubbles and state-of-the-art facilities be enough to distract from the action off the ice? Lance Santos, TLT World. Japan's Princess Mako has forfeited her royal status after marrying her college sweetheart, a commoner. But their romance was exactly a fairy tale. The couple's two-year engagement attracted so much negative media attention that the former princess was recently diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Shreib Hassan reports. A union that many Japanese have criticized, but one that's happened nevertheless. The emperor's niece, Mako Komora, married Kiko Komora in a civil ceremony on Tuesday. The bride and groom appeared happy, if a little subdued, at a media conference afterwards. I understand there are various thoughts on my marriage with Kei. I'm very sorry to the people who had trouble with our marriage. Also, I feel gratitude towards people who cared and quietly worried about me, or people who were not misled by the non-factual information and still continued to support me and Kay. The ceremony took place as dozens of people marched in protest in parts of Tokyo, principally against the princess's choice of a commoner. As for the reason why I am against the marriage, there are various alleged problems involving Kei Komura and his mother that have been reported. However, they forced through this marriage without giving us any explanation. They are getting married without an explanation, nor do they want to be blessed by the public. So as a citizen, I can't stay quiet. That's why we are protesting against it now. Komura and the now former Princess Marco's relationship was criticized almost from the time it came into the public eye. Allegations of financial problems involving Komura's mother are the latest cloud over the relationship. But royalty watchers say it's the bridegroom's humble background that is the main problem. Especially for conservative Japanese who see the imperial household as living gods. It's led to the princess being diagnosed with PTSD, but she's remained steadfast in her choice. I was terrified and sad when false information was covered by the media as if it's the truth and spread to become an unfounded story. I'm appreciative to those who continue to believe in K even in difficult situations. The couple now plans to move to New York, where Komora works as a lawyer, and are hopeful that the distance will give them a chance at a fairy tale ending. Shoaib Hassan, TRT World. 26 precious West African artifacts will finally be returning home. They were looted from Benin by French colonial soldiers more than a century ago. But before saying adieu, they were given one final exhibition in Paris. Hubra Akkoch reports. One last time in a Paris museum before being sent back to their country of origin. France is set to return 26 colonial era artifacts known as Abome treasures to Benin after their final exhibit at the Musée du Quebrani, Jacques Chirac. These art pieces are of essential importance for Benin. It has been more than a century that these pieces have been removed from their historical context. In 1892, French colonial forces acquired the Abome treasures in a raid at the Kingdom of Tanhum, located in the south of present-day Benin. They were given to a Paris museum a year later and have been housed at French galleries ever since. They are very much engraved on the French memory as well, and a part of a common history. For me, it is a new episode in the history of these artifacts, a very tumultuous history. In 2017, French President Emmanuel Macron said France needs to right the wrongs of the past and pledge to return all looted African artifacts. But so far, Paris has only returned one, a historic sword, to Senegal. And France still has more than 90,000 artifacts from sub-Saharan Africa being held in its museums.
26 artifacts might seem like a drop in the ocean, but the move has potential ramifications for other European museums which could face losing many of its most prized items. Kubra Akoc, Tiati World. And it was a record-setting week at the auction block. I'm going to sell it on this side for $35 million. Last chance, fair warning, and selling. Alir, it's yours. So, congratulations. <laughs> 11 Pablo Picasso paintings sold for almost $110 million as they went under the hammer at the Bellagio Gallery of Fine Art in Las Vegas. The crown jewel of the collection, Woman in a Red-Orange Barrette, fetched the highest bid at $40.5 million. Meanwhile, a pair of Nike sneakers worn by Michael Jordan during his first NBA season sold for a record $1.47 million. That's the highest price ever paid for game-worn shoes in any sport. Well, that rounds up your week of news here on Playback. Stay tuned to TRT World for the latest stories.